Okay, welcome back everyone to the fourth lecture. This is the last lecture before holiday gap. You'll all be set free for a few weeks. So you'll, I'll give you a very enjoyable homework to do over those uh, several weeks. I'll talk about that in the last slide. Um, I have a lot to talk about today and I'm excited about this because there's some new material here uh, with wiggly functions uh, to get to at the end. Uh, that said, everything you will see today is actually a linear regression despite the fact that there will be some curves. Uh, this is part of the mystery uh, to help you understand is, is how that actually works. Okay, where were we last time? Uh, we had done our first uh, linear regression. Not, not the first for all of you, but uh, your first and your born again education in, in linear regression. And we managed to get this uh, posterior distribution for the regression of height on weight. Uh, and we can take just from the Precy output um, the A and B values and draw a line with those where uh, A is the value of uh, the expected value of height when weight is at its average value right? in this case it's 155 let's call it you can see it on that the average value of weight is I don't know in this data set somewhere around 45 something like that and um, and then B is for every unit uh, every unit change in weight the expected change in height is almost exactly one unit as well, 0.9. Uh, it's kilograms versus centimeters, uh, by the way. Okay, this is uh, insufficient because we want to get uncertainty onto this graph. Uh, the posterior distribution is not a single line. Bayesian inference doesn't give you a point estimate. It gives you the posterior distribution, which contains an infinite number of lines, each of them ranked by its relative plausibility compared to all the other infinite number of lines. <laughs> Isn't calculus wonderful? And uh, so we'd like to get some more lines on this graph. So let me walk you through the idea of showing the uncertainty in the inference. Uh, here's the basic idea. Uh, uh, we're going to sample from the posterior distribution to do this. Uh, one of the reasons to do use the sampling procedure is it's easier to think with. Uh, but another very important one is this procedure will work for any model you ever want to fit, no matter what the basic functions are that are inside of it. Any model. You can sample from the posterior and then just push the samples back through the model itself to plot the uncertainty in its inferences. It works for anything. Linear regressions have analytical solutions for the, for the compatibility intervals, but lots of fancy, interesting models you'll want to do in your life don't. Uh, this procedure will work for anything, and that's why I teach it, and not the special case. Um, we uh, get, a, a, of course, our approximation of the posterior distribution from this um, quadratic approximation, assuming it's multivariate normal. And then we process these samples uh, to effectively integrate over all the uncertainty in the posterior distribution. So you're doing calculus here, but it does not feel like you're doing calculus. Yeah, if you like doing calculus, you're welcome to do it for real. Uh, <laughs> but this, this is real calculus, but it just doesn't feel like it. It feels so much nicer, right? Uh, so when we sample from the posterior distribution, there's this function extract samples in um, the rethinking package, which again, all that function does, you can look inside its guts if you want, all it does is use the quadratic approximation, define that as a multivariate normal, and use the built-in random number generator to sample random values from that multivariate normal. And then you end up with this data frame. It looks like data, but it's not. It's ra random samples from the posterior distribution. Each row in this uh, uh, data frame is a line. Right? The A and B values define a line, and the posterior distribution is full of lines, lots of lines, lots of different ones. But lines that are more plausible, have more ways to produce the data that you've actually seen, are going to show up more in these random samples. So we can plot all the rows from this thing and have a bunch of lines on our graph, and the, they'll overlap more in the area where it's plausible that the lines exist. And from that, we get the uncertainty and stuff. I'm going to show you pictures of this in a second so you understand, but that's all we're doing. And this works for, again, anything. So um, to see this work and also reinforce for you the way Bayesian updating works, let's start with a reduced data set to begin. Instead of the, I don't know, what is it, 350 adult individuals in the data set, let's start with 10. 10 randomly sampled adults. And uh, fit our, our linear regression model to it. Uh, what does that mean? It means we get a quadratic approximation of the posterior distribution. Um, sample from it. 
So we get some lines, and then I plot, I think those are 20 lines from the posterior distribution. Just 20 of these rows. I take the A and B value on any particular row, draw a line with that, and then the next one and the next one. And you'll see they're very different than the prior. You may remember the prior. It was sort of all over the place. It was positive end. Right, well, it was, we, first it was crazy, and then we made it less crazy. Uh, but now they're, they're very concentrated around uh, where the data are that they saw, because <coughs> our model learned from the data. Uh, and you can see there's a lot of scatter because with only 10 individuals, uh, the model just really isn't sure exactly uh, where the line would be. Does this make sense? You can see it. You can visualize it this way. Uh, let's increase the sample. Now 50. Uh, we add 40 more adults into the sample. Uh, fit, uh, update the model. Again, plot 20 lines. You'll see that they get more concentrated. Uh, and you'll start to see this phenomenon that is universal in uh, regression models that the uncertainty at the ends is broader than it is at the mean. Right? If you look at the mean of both variables, that's this pivot point that the regression lines pivot around, and you have a lot more certainty around there. Right? The line must pass through the mean of both variables, basically. It has to, otherwise it's a terrible line. Right? If you're at the average weight, and you, you, I ask you, if I tell you that there's an individual in this population at the average weight, and I ask you, now what's your best guess of their height, you should guess the average height. Right. Any other guess is silly, I assert. And I'll let you think about that over the weekend. Right. So the model didn't know that. It had to figure it out. You can give it that information. But then that's an intuition you might have. Uh, the ends, on the other hand, are more uncertain because a tiny little pivot is going to create a big amount of uncertainty at the extremes in these lines. And that's why you get this, what I call the bow tie phenomenon, uh, like bow tie pasta. People used to wear ties that were actually shaped like that. But now it's just pasta. Right. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, 150 points, it gets very tight now uh, around that. And then if we use the whole data set at 352 individuals, uh, very tight indeed. Conditional on wanting a line to describe these data, lines are all in that narrow space. That doesn't mean the line is right, That is, but you constrain the model to pick out lines. And so it did, and it likes these lines <laughs> very much. <laughs> it hates all the other lines. Right, so the high probability lines are all in that region. Does this make sense? You see how this works? And so when you see in papers those uh, confidence regions drawn around a regression line, those are just smooth, nice ways of showing the scatter of lines. Uh, but you could just show the lines. Uh, this is aesthetic too. Uh, that said, I can show you how to draw the confidence regions. Let me walk you through this. Um, this, this. This section of the chapter, of chapter four, moves very slowly, so I encourage you to read it afterwards and, and go through all the steps. Uh, I'm going to run through the recipe for you here. You will still have questions afterwards, but I, I think the chapter will answer them for you. So the basic idea is that any particular value of the x-axis variable of weight in this example, there's a distribution of predictions. Mu has some density. It's very confident about values in, in the middle and less confident about values outside. So let, let's pick any old random value of the x-axis variable to use as an example, like 50, 50 kilograms. And so we consider an individual 50 kilograms. What does the model expect the height of this individual is like? And we get this from the equation for mu. Uh, we extract the samples, and we just push the samples back into mu. But you see I fixed a 50 in the prediction equation. Yeah? You see it, the number 50? Special out there, shining bright uh, in the expression. And then mu at 50 now is going to be a long list with one value of mu for every sample from the posterior distribution. And that means there's a distribution of mu's now, right? And that's what the model sees, is it sees, it isn't sure how tall the individual at 50 is, but it's sure it's in this region defined by this density. Does this make sense? Uh, and so you get an expected value of mu in the middle, and you also get the interval from this, the compatibility interval, the range of values which are compatible with this model and these data. Make sense? Uh, so we can do that. We don't want to do this just for 50, though. We want to do it for every x-axis value. Uh, and then for every one of these, we can use these distributions to have an interval to draw that bow tie up. And it work, turns out to be the same calculation as just clustering a bunch of lines on your graph, the spaghetti uh, approach, right? And this, this is what produces the smooth bow tie. So here's how it looks. 
you need, and again, the, the chapter walks through this very slowly, and you'll have to sit down with your computer and, and, uh, and do it for real. Uh, you need to make a sequence of x-axis values you want to calculate these intervals uh, at, and that's what I call weight.sequence up top, uh, from 25 kilograms to 70 in units of one kilogram. There's nothing special about those values. You decide how smooth you want this to be, uh, how far you want it to go. You can make the model extrapolate out to 150 kilograms if you want, you know, whatever you like to do. Um, and then, uh, uh, you just send these in as fake data to this helper function in the rethinking package called link. And what does link do? Link calculates the value of any linear model in a QAP model for any data you push into it using the posterior distribution that you've got that, for that model. Um, and there's a box in the chapter which shows you the guts of how link works. Um, uh, I think I say a little bit about that on the next slide, actually, but not the details of it. It's not doing anything magically except taking each value in weight sequence and pushing it into mu and then storing those and then the next. It just loops. That's all it does. But it's nice to have a function like link to save you a little bit of time, right? That's why I wrote it, to save me time. It wasn't for you. It was for me. <laughs> but you're welcome to use it. <laughs> yeah. um, and what you end up with in this value mu uh, is a matrix with a thousand rows, each row is a sample from the posterior distribution, and each column is a value of weight. Right? So there are 46 of them. Uh, and then you can plot these up uh, and make pretty pictures with them. So this is the only thing I'm going to say about how link works, and again, there's a very detailed box in the chapter to explain how this works. Uh, it samples from the posterior distribution, it takes the series of predictor values that you give it. If you don't give it any, it'll use the values that were in the data you casting when you fit the model. Uh, and then for each of these values, it just sticks it into the, uh, uh, the linear model, and then it uh, returns that big matrix, and then our job is to summarize that. And so here's the code where we do this. Um, we extract, uh, this is like uh, rolling your own link right here. This is all the code you need to do it. And uh, you extract, uh, we write our own function for mu link, where I've just written post A and post B times weight minus X bar, where weight gets passed in as any random value. And then we use this cool function in R called S apply, which you might as well just call it loop. <laughs> what does it do? It takes each value in the first argument and it passes it into the function in the second argument. And S means simplified, simplified apply. It applies the first thing to the second thing and then it simplifies the result, that's what it does. Um, and then we, uh, do apply, I know, R is maniacal, right? It's good. There's S apply and there's apply, and how are they different? Don't, don't ask that question. Just, just keep moving. <laughs> no. Uh, uh, S apply simplifies the result, apply doesn't, uh, uh, which is what we want here. Um, apply takes the, the matrix mu, uh, the second dimension, which are the columns, and it calculates the mean of each. All right, so it gives you the average over all the posterior samples at each, so that gives you the central prediction for each weight value and then when we pass it to HBDI, we get the highest posterior density interval for each weight value. And those are the values we're going to plot out that gives us a bow tie. So you think about what's going on graphically, is at each weight we've got a distribution, and I've just plotted them as points on the left here. So it's fuzzy, right? You can see the bow tie. Uh, and then, uh, now it's very hard to see uh, projected in the room, but those of you watching at home will be able to see it. There's a gray bow tie that has the same shape as the uh, points plotted on the left. You can almost see it if you're in the room, right, Squint? You all have good eyes, can you see it? Yeah, okay, laughing faces in the room. Uh, it's there, it's very light gray, you can almost see it. It's very tight interval. It's the same information and it's just comes from plotting the boundaries of that compatibility interval. That's all it is, and that's where the magic bow tie comes from. But this will work for any function, any shape. Uh, we're gonna do it for polynomials and splines at the end of today and you'll see that the same procedure works exactly same, even if the additive model changes. Okay, um, so again, there's a correspondence between the spaghetti plotting style, <coughs> uh, this kind, where you just line up all your, your strands of spaghetti, all the different lines from the posterior, posterior distribution plotted here, again, for 10, 20, 50, 100, 200, 350 individuals in the data, and you see how the uncertainty gets narrower as you go. And then we can just think about it in the bow tie form, where it's the same information, but now we've computed the interval at every x-axis value, and we just draw that shaded shape defined by those intervals. Uh, and I'll oscillate a little bit back and forth so you can see. It's spaghetti style, 
and there's the shaded interval style. It's the same information, it's just a different visual presentation. Does this make sense? Uh, one of the advantages of spaghetti style is it makes clear that there's no boundary that has meaning. Uh, one of the problems, I think, with these compatibility intervals is it, it's easy for all of us to slip into the idea that the boundary you've arbitrarily chosen to draw this graph has some meaning, some scientific meaning, and it doesn't. There's nothing, nothing happens at that boundary. There's a continuous change in uncertainty, right? And the values on one side of that boundary inside of it and outside of it are nearly the same. <laughs> There's no magic event that happens there. That's true of all of these things, right? Uh, probability is a continuous space and nothing happens at that boundary. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but again, there's a slow and patient section in the text on this. We can do the same procedure for sigma, for the prediction interval around all of the heights. What we've just done is only for the mean. There's uncertainty about where the mean is, but there's also uncertainty about the exact heights you're going to observe. There's some envelope of values that we expect the whole distribution of heights to be in, and a good model will predict that range. So I show you that here, um, that light gray region uh, you'll see our old bow tie there in the middle, but now there's this light gray region which covers most of the actual observed heights, and that's when you use sigma to simulate actual heights, and you calculate intervals from that as well. And the code to do this is in the chapter. There's no new tricks. Uh, exact works exactly the same way. Um, and there's a helper function in rethinking called sim, which does this whole thing. It pushes things on the outcome space. But again, there's a box that shows you exactly how it works. And I think the important thing for all of you now is to understand conceptually what this is doing and how it relates to the structure of the model. Yeah, and then the coding details, if you're fuzzy on those, those will come fine when you do homework. Uh, it always does. You just have to sit down and do it. Uh, but you want to get the conceptual stuff sorted first. Okay, um, that's linear regression. The funny thing about linear regression is it's not linear. Uh, it's just like a maddening <coughs> thing about the term. It's Conventionally, it's used to draw lines on, on graphs, but um, really linear regression is additive. You have this uh, equation for the mean, for mu, which is a sum of some parameter times some observed variable. It's a sum of a bunch of terms like that, and it's an additive equation, and additive things are linear in mathematics. They're like swappable words. Uh, but for a human being, the words additive and linear are really different, right? So we should call these additive regressions because you can use them to draw things that don't look like lines. Uh, and that's what I want to do for you now. I want to spend the rest of today having fun drawing lines. Sorry, the people, people aren't in the room can't see me doing scare quotes. So anyway, you can hear the sarcasm in my voice. Lines um, <laughs> and uh, curves. Uh, we're going to draw curves from lines. And the first of these... Uh, well, I should say, why do you want to do this? Uh, there's, there's no reason that nature should be populated by linear relationships between two variables, right? Maybe over narrow ranges, that's fine as an approximation. Uh, but eventually, uh, it's pretty silly. And I'll show you uh, some credible cases in a moment. We'll work through some data examples. And so we routinely have reason to think about curve linear relationships between uh, two variables. Uh, if you're a social scientist, you're used to this because age. If you study humans, age can't be linear over the lifespan of a human. We just live too long. Uh, so, so linear effects with age is never, only over the narrowest little ranges. I mean, even you don't need a long lifespan. Child development, there's rapid changes uh, in behavior over child development. And linear functions don't work very well, even over like three-year periods from five to eight. Uh, you need nonlinear relationships. So... Um, there are common strategies. The two most common, what I want to introduce you to today, are polynomial regression. Uh, this is by far the most common. Uh, this is the common idea of adding a squared term to a linear regression. I'll show you the mechanics of this in a moment. It's extremely common. It's also pretty bad. Uh, I think if you're wise about this, there's nothing wrong with using it, as is always. If you, if you understand the golem you're using, then you can use it responsibly. Uh, often polynomial regression is used irresponsibly uh, because of a lack of good training that people have received. Again, it's never your fault. It's a vast sociological conspiracy. <laughs> right? And uh, uh, so I'm not trying to dissuade you from using polynomial regressions, but I want to caution you about them. And I'll, I'll give you some suggestions as I teach them to you about why I think they're badly behaved. Uh, and the second is splines. Uh, there are many different kinds of splines. I'm going to show you what are called basis splines, which are uh, probably the most common, uh, almost certainly the most common. Um, if you use computer drawing software, you've used basis splines. 
uh, that's how, like Illustrator, uh, there are Bezier curves and then there are basis splines, and basis splines are better than Bezier curves, and uh, they're used in drawing. Uh, splines are very flexible, much more flexible than polynomials, and they don't exhibit the common pathologies of polynomial equations, and so they're often a much better choice. Uh, that said, both polynomial regressions and splines are geocentric strategies. There's nothing mechanistic about them. There's no science in the shape of the function. They're just approximations, like epicycles, right? Ptolemaic devices to let us predict where things are. So you have to, when you receive the information from your model, you have to keep that in mind and realize that the, there's nothing mechanistic about this, and therefore the predictions are not necessarily trustworthy when you extrapolate outside the range of the data. They can exhibit very strange behavior. That said, if you keep that in mind, it's perfectly fine, just like the geocentric model. If you want to build a planetarium, the geocentric model is good. <laughs> it's really, really useful. Um, but you need to do it responsibly. Yeah. Okay. What is polynomial regression? I know the name just rolls off the tongue. Uh, this is a descriptive strategy for drawing curves um, in relationship between two variables, two or more variables. And the idea here is that there's nothing special about uh, the line that's a first order polynomial. You can have second order polynomials as well. Uh, you once learned this as a parabola, and then all we have to do to create one is add, take our uh, x-axis variable and square it and give it its own coefficient for the squared term. And now that's the equation for a parabola. You learned once upon a time. I appreciate that you may have blacked out and forgotten all about that part of your secondary school education, right, where you did geometry proofs. Never did it again. Trigonometry, conic sections, yeah? Sorry. <laughs> it was a good time, wasn't it? A simpler part of your life. And uh, uh, we could keep going. There's third order polynomials where you add a cubic term, fourth order where you add a, uh, uh, what, is it, what is it to the fourth called? Is there a fancy, what is it? Quartic, ah, thank you. I knew there must have been a special term for this. Quartic and then quintic is to the fifth, right? Quintic, so on, Hep heptic, what is sixth? <laughs> uh, and, and on and on and on. Um, and we'll do that in a later chapter, actually. We'll push this to the level of absurdity at the uh, beginning of chapter seven. I have an absurd exercise you'll enjoy where we do this. I think we go all the way to sixth order polynomials. Um, we're not gonna do that today. We're just gonna do up to third order. Uh, or the data we're gonna use are the total sample from the Kung height and weight data. And so before we were just working with adults, and you see them here shaded in blue. Now we're going to include all the kids. Uh, kids are people too, and we want to predict their uh, weights and heights. So uh, I think just looking at this scatter plot, you can appreciate that this is not a line. You can fit a line to this, and we'll do that. I'll show you what that looks like. Uh, it just won't fit very well. The model will be very happy with its line. It'll be very sure about which line actually to use, but it'll be a terrible set of predictions. Um, instead, let's fit a parabola, and this will be uh, a curvilinear relationship. So how do we build this? Well, we can just take the previous model. Uh, again, it's a geocentric strategy, so we just glue on an epicycle here. Uh, and we square the centered weight. So x here, keep in mind, should be centered. You want to have already subtracted the mean value of x from it, so you have a centered variable. Uh, and uh, y, so that alpha can be the mean. right? Uh, so you can set a prior for alpha that makes sense. And then you need to give it a new uh, beta coefficient here, B2. Uh, setting priors for these higher order terms in polynomial regressions is really hard. Uh, and I've just made up uh, a harmless one here. Uh, I encourage you to simulate from this prior and see what happens and try, red or try, what, try different values. Um, it's hard because beta, beta sub two has no meaning <laughs> biologically. It's the curvature of this thing, but the total curvature of the parabola depends upon both B1 and B2. So neither of them can be interpreted in isolation. And the only way to understand what this prior means is to simulate from the prior and see what the predictions are. This is super awkward. Uh, it absolutely is. It's one of the drawbacks of parabolic models is that the parameters don't have meaning, right? And the shape of the curve is determined jointly by all of the parameters. It's, it's a horrible problem in interpretation. And then once you fit the model, the same thing's still true. You'll have some summary statistics about these betas, and you just can't look at them and figure out what's going on. You didn't have to plot the predictions. That's not so bad, though. Uh, for any reasonably complicated model, that's the only way to understand it anyway, is to plot the predictions. So you should get used to it. 
Uh, yeah, it sounds like I'm trying to scare you off from this. I'm not. You, know, you just have to use it responsibly, right? It's like driving. You just It's fine to drive. Driving is fine. It is. Uh, you, everybody should do less of it, but <laughs> um, you should do it responsibly, right? Uh, anyway, uh, otherwise it's the same model. This is just, this is a linear regression in the sense that linear means additive. Uh, but when you plot the relationship between um, x, which is weight here, and height, it's not going to look like a line. Okay, so we, we fit these models with standardized predictors. So I'm going to add one more step from before. Um, before I said we wanted to center x so that we can interpret alpha, and you nearly always want to do that. Uh, but we also, for the sake of just getting the machine to work, it's very useful to standardize the predictor variables. And this means you center them and then you divide by the standard deviation. So we take weight, we subtract the average weight from each weight value, and then we uh, divide each of those zero centered values by the standard deviation of weight. And this takes weight and makes it into a set of z-scores, if that's language that's familiar to people here. Uh, and this is nice because then a value of one is one standard deviation out in weight from the mean. Uh, this is a nice way to do the variables, and the machine, the fitting software, R, works better um, on standardized variables because it doesn't have to guess the scale of this thing. It doesn't have to deal with giant values like 200. Uh, and then it has trouble searching that space. Uh, so it's nearly always a good idea. Uh, this should be your default behavior when fitting regressions, um, unless you have some good scientific excuse not to, which may happen. This is a good thing to do. So uh, here's the code. The first two lines of this code do the standardization. Right, there's a function in R called scale, which will do this for you. You don't have to work and write this out, but I want to show you what it's actually doing. All, this, all scale does is subtract the mean. We take each weight value and subtract the mean, and then we divide it all by the standard deviation. You end up with a new variable. Here it's uh, weight underscore s, which is the standardized weight. It's z-scores. And then we construct the squared version of this by squaring it, right? I know this is exciting science, right? And, uh, uh, and then we stuff it into the Quap model formula as before. Does it make sense? I know there's a lot of extra stuff here, but really there's just one little epicycle we're gluing in here. And then there's the, you know, data manicure we have to do to make the fitting work well. If you don't standardize uh, what happens, I encourage you to try this at home. <laughs> uh, Leave the raw weights, don't center them, don't standardize them, and try running this model. Uh, it will fit less efficiently. It may, uh, it may complain at you a lot about not being able to find good starting values. All kinds of stuff may go wrong. Uh, so it's, it's just about rescaling things um, uh, to help the fitting work well. Okay, uh, let's redo the spaghetti thing. But now the spaghetti strands are not straight. They've been cooked for 30 seconds, and so they're flexible. And I don't know, this metaphor is really not help helping. Is it? I, should, I should think about these before I use them. Uh, but uh, now we've got parabolas. The posterior is not full of lines now. It's full of parabolas, an infinite number of them. Every parabola that could exist is inside the posterior distribution. It sounds great. It's magnificent, isn't it? <laughs> and you did that. And uh, now we sample from the posterior distribution. And we've got a sample of the high probability parabolas, which are a tiny slice of that infinite space of parabolas. And we draw them up. So uh, to see what's going on, it will be helpful, and this will help you understand how these parabolic models work, to start with, again, only 10 individuals. So I randomly sample 10 individuals. Uh, they happen to all be adults because of the, actually, this is like the first 10 in the data set. This is how I did it. I take the first 10 individuals in the HAL data set. They're all adults just because of the way they're ordered in the data set, uh, which helps you see what happens when that happens. Uh, over the full range now, we get parabolas that fan out wildly outside the range of the observed values. So the parabola fits the observed uh, adult values, which have higher weights. You notice that weight zero means the average weight in the whole sample. It doesn't mean zygote, right? It means average, because it's standardized, yeah? So all the adults are above average weight, right? Because they're heavier than children. And uh, the, these parabolas end up being relatively straight in the range of the data, because they need to be, because the relationship is pretty linear in that range. And then outside of that range, the functions are allowed to do anything they want. Uh, and they just flail about uh, on the left there, all over a huge range of scientifically impossible values. Right? But of course, the model doesn't know. It, it's fine. So this is a phenomenon that's 
uh, always present in polynomial equations. Outside the observed range of data, the function can do anything it wants and it will. Uh, and it will just flail about. And so the uncertainty intervals on the edges of the observed data range always fan out uh, and expand. Uh, and this is a big problem actually with the predictions of these sorts of models is that they get necessarily uh, more uncertain on the edges of the observed range. This is not true of splines, as I'll show you when we get to splines. Um, this arises because every parameter of the parabola, uh, in this case parabola, of the polynomial affects the shape at every point. Uh, every parameter acts globally on the shape. It's a super frustrating thing. So you can't tune one parameter of a parabola and tune only one tiny region of its shape. It's just, <laughs> just a very frustrating fact about how they work. And again, splines don't have this problem, which is why I will teach them to you. Um, does this make sense for a second? Can I add some more people? Yeah? So now 20 people, we add the next 10. Um, now we've got some children. And now the flailing stops because there are some points in the lower range to inform the model how it should behave uh, at lower weight values. And now we get uh, curves within a much smaller region of parameter space. Make sense? We've got we've got some nice parabolas now. Um, Fifty individuals uh, we're filling in now. The it's getting concentrated. Uh, the model's growing more and more confident that if you want a parabola, these are your parabolas. You want one of these. They're getting piled up on top of one another. And then with a hundred individuals, even more so, it gets darker and darker. Um, and three hundred and all five hundred and forty-four individuals. It's basically a, a thick, dark lawn. Those are a bunch of parabolas, but they're superimposed on one another. Uh, the model is very confident. So what is this model saying? It's saying, conditional on wanting a parabola to describe this relationship, here are your parabolas. <laughs> and it's really, really happy with these parabolas. That doesn't mean a parabola is correct. Does that make sense? To drive that point home, let me show you some other polynomials. So uh, we could also do the cubic, uh, which is on the right here. Before I before we uh, 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 look at the cubic, uh, look in the lower left at the linear one. You know how to fit this model. The model also loves these lines. It loves these lines. The, 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 mo the linear model loves its lines just as much as the parabolic model loves its parabolas. Right? And uh, because each of these models, you instructed it to only consider that shape, and it found the shapes that are consistent with the data, compatible with the data in that range. And there's a lot of data, so it becomes increasingly, it's very, very sure, conditional on that shape, that these are, these are the parameter values you want. But it, that is not an endorsement of the model. Does that make sense? It's the model endorsing those lines. <laughs> yeah? This is always true. You, it's the small world, large world distinction. The model only thinks in small world confidence. And then you have to supervise it and be critical about the overall structure of the model, because the model will never do that for itself. It's just not responsible enough to do that. It will wreck Prague, as I keep saying. So uh, those lines don't fit the overall data very well, but there's almost no uncertainty in where they are. Yeah, this is a funny thing. The confidence intervals are tiny uh, on the position of that line, but it's still a bad model. Uh, the, you're familiar with the parabola. I've extended uh, the data range out a tiny bit here, showing you the quadratic relationships. You can see it tends to curve down up top. This is another problem with polynomial models. They cannot do what are called monotonic relationships. What does that mean? A monotonic relationship never changes direction. It either always increases or decreases. There are lots of things in nature like that. Uh, you know that people, well, really old people do get shorter, right? But in this data set, that's not what's happening. Why is that parabola curving down? Because it has to. There has to come a point where parabolas curve down, right? They're rainbows, right? Rainbows are actually circles. Uh, you just can't see the bottom, right? So it's this bad example. But unless you're in an airplane. Anybody ever seen a rainbow in an airplane? You can see the whole circle. Uh, but, uh, so uh, this thing must curve down, right? It, just, it has to someplace. And since you know, the, the downward curving part doesn't have any data, it's free. It doesn't hurt your fit at all. Uh, it's absolutely fine. Cubics do the same thing. They're going to turn twice, but they have to turn. And a quartic equation is going to have to turn three times. And they just have to turn. They can never be monotonic. Uh, and this is a problem. Uh, there are other functions which are monotonic. And if you need one, uh, let me know. I have lots in my desk drawer. So I can give you a few. Uh, 
The cubic uh, polynomial, we add the cubic term, we take our standardized x, we cube it, we add it to the model, another beta, beta sub 3, the model fits fine, just as before. The code for this is in the book, you should definitely do it yourself. Uh, and then we plot that up, that fits even better uh, as before, why? Because it can turn one more time, so it really now goes through the center of this. But you notice now it's extrapolating upwards, probably to infinity <laughs> uh, up there on the far end. Uh, bad behavior, typical behavior of a polynomial model. Again, that may not be a problem if you're responsible and you understand, you, you expect that behavior uh, at, the, at the boundaries of observed data. Uh, but you have to uh, think about that responsibly. Okay, uh, so this is just a summary of the stuff I just told you, uh, what I call the polynomial grief. Um, polynomials uh, always make absurd predictions outside the range of the data. In this example, I had that outside of the range be really outside of the range. It was below the minimum value we had seen. This can also happen internally to the range you see. And when we get to chapter seven, I'll show you that. If you've got a gap in your observed values and a very flexible polynomial, it'll do silly things in the gap. Because again, there's no data in the gap, so it's free. I'm going to show you this with some hominin brain evolution data in chapter seven, right? But there is a big gap between humans and other things. And so in that gap, the function's free to do anything it likes, and it will do whatever it likes uh, so that it can fit the data. Um, the parameters, uh, I think this is a bigger problem, is the, the parameter, each parameter of the polynomial affects every point on the polynomial. They all jointly determine the overall shape. And so you can't, the, the model, when it's tuning through the posterior, can't tune them independently to create local fit in different regions. Uh, this is a big problem. And it, it's actually the reason that you get these absurd predictions. Uh, it, it's all related. Um, and I mentioned the monotonicity problem. Polynomials aren't actually that flexible. They're, they have to turn, right? And they always turn uh, a certain number of times, uh, uh, one less than their degree. So uh, a second order polynomial turns once. That's a parabola. A third order polynomial must turn twice. It, it's, it has to. Uh, it, it can't avoid it. And so on and so forth. Um, and so they can do strange things. So, what to do instead? Uh, you have a number of options. For the rest of our time today, let me tell you about a common one and one I think is really useful, uh, but it's just as geocentric. It's not a mechanistic model. That's not necessarily bad. I like geocentric models, right? You just have to use them responsibly and not, not overinterpret them. Uh, this approach is also satisfying because it's born from a physical system that was used previously to do the same thing. Uh, they're called splines. What is a spline? It's a very strange word, right? Uh, a spline is this metal bar uh, that you see in this picture. This is a draftsman's table. Uh, there are weights that are attached uh, to this bar to bend it so that drafters, um, architects, could draw smooth curves in controlled ways back when people used paper, <laughs> like drafters still do. Actually, lots of people do this. Or if you make boats, has anybody here ever made a boat? That's I know, a strange question. <laughs> no, okay. Uh, if you want to make a boat and have it be the right shape, using a spline is great for cutting out the shape of things. It's a, it's a very useful idea. And uh, otherwise, you have to have a really good eye. Uh, and you want the boat to fit right, otherwise it leaks. It's bad times when boats leak. Bring a bucket, right? Sort of thing. So these things still exist. You can go buy them uh, in art stores. And um, the spline is the bar. And these uh, weights are like anchors. Uh, we're going to call them knots. They're places where you, there's a, a, a pivot point, a potential pivot point for the shape of the spline. Um, so the splines we're going to use are called B splines. And because they're anchored in these local places, that's like parameter action. Uh, they, the parameters act locally, not globally. But you can get a globally very wiggly, that's a technical scientific term, wiggly, uh, wiggly function. Uh, uh, with a bunch of <laughs> locally wiggly functions by putting them together. So I'll show you how this works. Uh, this is a very effective strategy. Uh, uh, it's good for extrapolation and detrending of things, but you just have to remember that it's geocentric. It's describing relationships. It's not explaining them. Does that make sense? And so you have to, if you're going to use it for prediction, you have to exercise some responsibility about how it works. A little bit of terminology to give you an idea how these splines work. I'm going to use what are called basis splines, uh, which is what I'm describing. Um, I'll tell you what a basis is in a moment. Uh, the basis function is a local function, and the whole spline is made out of interpolating 
smoothly gliding between these local wiggly functions. But there's a number of them, and each of them is called a basis function. Basis, you can think of as just a term for component, right? In this context, in mathematical language. Um, so we're going to build a big wiggly function from smaller, less wiggly functions. But each of those smaller, less wiggly functions has local parameters which describe its importance. And so you can tune them individually and you don't get these wild swings that the polynomials exhibit. This is what's nice about them. And again, if you've used uh, computer-aided drawing software, chances are you've used a basis plot. There'll be anchor points that you put on a curve and you'll drag it around. Either it's a Bezier curve or it's a basis spline. Basis splines are better than Bezier curves. They can do more stuff. They're more wiggly. Uh, Okay. Oh, and last thing. Um, B splines or basis splines are often called B splines. If you have a Bayesian B spline, I know, it's, it's called a P spline. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, it's not my fault. <laughs> I take no responsibility for this, but I have to tell you these things so that you recognize it. The P stands for penalized because priors are often thought of as penalties in the non Bayesian context. So, machine learning people use models that look analytically like Bayesian models, but they call them penalty models, and that's what the P stands for, penalized spline. Um, you can think of it as priors. Uh, why the word penalty? Wait till chapter seven. I'll explain to you why the word penalty makes sense. Okay, so let's go local. Uh, think, what's this? Think global, uh, act local, right? The global movement, Jeff knows this, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, how do we do this? Uh, again, it's a linear model. It's just, just an additive equation for mu. Uh, but the uh, predictor variables that we put in here are not things we've observed. They're synthetic data, quote unquote data, that we build that defines the range of the curve that each parameter acts in. I know this is like crazy. It's like madness. The actual predictor of interest will not appear in your model. <laughs> Uh, nevertheless, you will get a fantastic approximation of the relationship between the predictor variable of interest and the outcome. And this is so weird, but it works uh, really well. I'll explain to, this, to you step by step. I left a lot of time in the lecture for this. We're going to go slow, go step by step. Uh, and then you know, all the codes in the book, um, you, can, you can master this. So look at our equation for mu here. It looks, looks just like a linear regression with a bunch of predictors, uh, B sub I uh, 1 and B sub I 2 and B sub I 3. These are like our polynomial equations. These would be like now separate variables, and they are. They're going to be separate variables, but we're going to make them up. Uh, and we make them up in a very special way so that they define the ranges that each of the parameters is relevant to, uh, the ranges of the values of the x-axis variable of interest. So there's going to be one parameter called a weight uh, parameter for each of the B variables, B is for basis, these are basis functions, and uh, the weights uh, affect uh, predictions in the range defined by those B variables. These B variables just turn on parameters over different ranges of the x-axis variable, and then the parameters affect the shape. I'll say that again, the B variables just turn on parameters over different finite ranges of the x-axis variable, and then the parameters affect the shape. Be, there's going to be pictures. <laughs> okay, you know me, right? There's going to be pictures. Um, so these are synthetic uh, variables, these basis function variables, and they can be super wiggly, they can be linear. I'm going to show you a simple linear example first, and then we're going to go full wiggle, okay? Uh, I want to use a new example. The, the height example is not really all that wiggly. So let's use something really wiggly, like climate data. You like climate data? Uh, so here's a data set that I'm very fond of. It's this historical Japanese cherry blossom festival data. So the date that the, the first cherry blossom blooms in Japan has been recorded for about 1,200 years now. Uh, and I'm giving you the data here uh, to play with. So, and there's a matching climate record. And it turns out there's a very interesting uh, relationship between the date of first bloom and the uh, March temperature uh, in the same year because the trees respond to temperature. That's how they, their phenology works. Uh, and there's a big signature, as you can imagine, of uh, climate change phenomena in these data. We're just going to look at the temperature data today. I mean, later on in the course, we'll look at the relationship between the two variables. But when you load this data, feel free to run a linear regression looking at the relationship between temperature and the date of the bloom. Uh, I assert there will be a very strong relationship, and, and you will understand why. Yeah? So we have cherry blossoms here uh, as well in, in Germany, right? So they're a familiar thing. Uh, but they really have a lot of them. Uh, in Japan. Uh, so what do these data look like? 
Uh, we could load this data set. Um, we're just going to look at the temperature data. As I said, we've got 1,215 observations. These are years. Uh, the, the earliest date is a little after the year 800. Uh, there's a few gaps early on because records, there were fires, records were lost, right? Uh, there's also some temperature. In the earlier dates, you're getting the temperature from like tree rings and all sorts of other things. There's approximations. Eventually, it's like real recordings from, you know, devices we now call thermometers, right? Uh, at least here. <laughs> and uh, it's a fantastic data set. So you can see this wiggles a lot. And um, I've, I've showed this temperature training with some transparency because there's some overlap, right? Some, sometimes when the temperature is more constant and you get uh, less movement, and then other times where it moves fast. And then you'll see, you know, you'll recognize the end of this trend, right? Everybody knows what's going on uh, at the end part here. Yeah? So our goal is to detrend this temperature record, meaning we want to fit a spline to it so we've got some ballistic interpretation for the average trajectory so that we could look at micro deviations and what they do, right? This is the general idea with this. This is the shape and you can do lots of stuff with this, but if you want to ask about the uh, impact of shorter term uh, phenomena, you need some trend at a certain scale uh, to compare those against. And there's just lots of wiggling. So let's just work with uh, the idea of getting an approximation to this of some arbitrary quality. And we're going to start with a terrible approximation and then we'll make it more wiggly. Uh, we'll do both approximations with a B spline technically a P spline, right? a penalized spline. How do these splines work? Uh, here's the recipe. Uh, first, you choose what are called knots. Knots are the locations of these heavy pieces of metal. Uh, they're not actually heavy pieces of metal in the mathematics. They're points where the basis splines pivot, uh, uh, determine the gaps between them and the width of the different basis splines. And there will be pictures uh, coming up next. Um, <coughs> Then you choose a degree of the basis functions. Degree here is, is polynomial degree. It, it determines how wiggly the local function can be, but only locally now. And again, there will be pictures, and I'll show you what this does. And then, as always in this business, since this is a Bayesian course, uh, you eventually find the posterior distribution of these weights. Uh, so there are an infinite number of combinations of weights, and they will make an infinite number of splines. You could sample from the prior and view them. Uh, but in the posterior, there will be a much smaller range of weights which are compatible with the data. And those, that'll be the spline we'll show. Make sense? But you'll run this just like any old linear regression. Because it is. It's an additive predictor. And it runs just like any old linear regression. But it will not look linear. OK, so let's do this with the Japanese cherry blossom temperature record. Actually, there's no cherry blossoms in this trend yet. <laughs> this is just a temperature record for one locale of Japan is what it is. So um, let's start with a simple example where we choose just five knots at equal quantiles of the data. Uh, there's, a, there's a certain, there's a big literature about how you choose knots. Uh, one of the conventions is you choose them at evenly spaced quantiles of the data. This is nice because it gives you more knots where there's more data. Uh, it makes sense. But there are other algorithms as well. And if you really get into splines, you should read you know, a book about them and, and get some sense about how this works. Packages typically do something just magical for you, determining them automatically. As always with my book, I'm not that nice, and I make you own every choice. <laughs> and so here we're going to own this one, but you should go into the code and fiddle around with it and see how it changes things. Uh, so we'll start with these five. We've got one at the median. Uh, we've got an anchor at each extreme, and then we've got two evenly spaced uh, anchors in between. These are like those heavy weights uh, on the uh, piece of metal. And this is where the functions can pivot, and it determines how many basis functions we get. So let's draw up the synthetic variables now, push the data off the table, and let's just think about construction of these synthetic variables, but they're constructed over the range that we want to interpolate over. So the, the actual year data now, think of year as a variable, we're never going to use those again. We just use them to define knots, and the knots have value of year. Right? The knots are anchored on year values, and we choose it that way, but we'll never use those year values again. They're gone. Right? Well, we use them to plot. Uh, but that's all we're going to do. And now we make some basis functions. And I'm going to start with a degree one basis function, which means a straight line. So what we're going to do is we're going to construct a wiggly function, which is composed of lines. Uh, then we'll do something even wigglier. But I thought this would be the easiest place to start. So what is going on in this graph? I appreciate, when I tried to learn about splines and I came across these graphs, I was like, WTF, right? Like, what is going on? Uh, in this scientific term, right? International scientific term for confusion, WTF. And uh, so um, 
What you're looking at is a plot with all of those synthetic variables. There are five of them, five basis functions. These are new synthetic variables. Each of them just turns on a weight parameter over a finite range of the x-axis variable. So uh, work with me here. Let's focus on the one in red. Um, looks like a tent, right? That's basis function four. Basis function four has its maximum value at the fourth knot, right? And it, at the fourth knot, it's the only basis function that has a non-zero value, yeah? And so, the, so the, its weight is determining the position of the spline at that point. And then as you move away from that knot, there are two neighboring basis functions which are turning on, right? Because their ranges are becoming relevant. And this is how the interpolation works. I know this looks like madness, uh, but it, it makes some beautiful curves. And so the fifth one turns on as you go towards the fifth knot, and the third one is, gets more powerful as you go to the third knot, and then the second one, and then the first one. So you've got five functions here that are gradually turning on and turning off, and they overlap one another. And each of them has its own precious parameter that determines it, the value of the spline uh, when you're in its range. Okay, there'll be more pictures. You don't have to get it all right now. Uh, this is what the basis functions are. When we make these higher degree, these will be curves. And I'll show you a picture of that in a little bit, but I thought it'd be nicer to start with lines. I hope I was correct. Uh, so at any, so I've drawn this year 1306 there for the point to, to show you that at any particular point, except when you're right at a knot, two of these basis functions are relevant. And so two parameters will be active and will determine the value of the prediction for the temperature, yeah? But which two are active changes as you slide across. And this is how splines are local, right? The parameters act locally, but you get a globally wiggly thing uh, of beauty. Okay, um, so what do we do with these things if we're gonna actually, uh, fit, oh, by the way, R has a built-in function for making these basis uh, functions for you. <laughs> so you don't have, it's just built in because uh, this is a very old strategy and it's built into R. And I'll show you the code to do this in the chapter. Skipping that step of constructing those things. Um, there's just this, mu is a thing you're familiar with. The only new trick here is I'm going to use linear algebra. I'm going to use matrix multiplication to deal with this long sum. You could have a lot of basis functions. We're going to have 15 in a second. We only got five right now. So you can imagine writing five terms, right? It would just be W1 times uh, the first column of this, uh, the first basis function variable. There was like a variable. It has value zero everywhere except those places where it's relevant, right? It goes to one there. Uh, plus W2 times the second basis function, W3, W4, W5. You only have five right now. But if you have 15, you don't want to keep writing. Uh, the way I've written it here using matrix multiplication, we can just have a matrix B where every, it's like a data table. Every column is a basis function and every row is a year. It's, it's, this is a synthetic data frame. And if we multiply, matrix multiply that matrix uh, by a vector of weights w, we get this linear predictor mu. Uh, those of you who've done some linear algebra, you're like, of course you do. And those of you who haven't, you're like W2F again, right? The international response for confusion. That's okay. Um, you can learn this matrix multiplication uh, in your leisure. The important thing to understand is it's just notational compression. There's no new math in linear algebra. It's all the same boring math you learned in secondary school. It's just expressed in a more confusing way. <laughs> so, no, it's, it's expressed in a very convenient way that makes calculations convenient. So that if the dimension of B and W change, you don't have to change your code. That's really nice. Uh, that's why I want to use it here. This is actually a really common way to talk about linear regression models. So uh, this code will run. It works fine in crap because it is a linear regression. Nothing new is going on here. We've got a prior for each of the weights. <laughs> if you make that prior tighter, the curve gets less wiggly. And this is the penalty we've been talking about. And you're going to have to have some patience with me. When we get to chapter 7, we're going to talk about those kinds of priors a lot and what they do for us and why you don't want flat priors there. You want penalties that reduce the wiggliness so that you don't do something called overfitting. Overfitting will ruin your day, right, or your tomorrow, more accurately. It'll make, uh, overfitting will make today great. It makes tomorrow terrible. Um, so what happens? Uh, when we plot these, so top part of this slide, I'm just repeating the, the equation for mu uh, up to the dot, 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 right? You know what dot, dot, dot means. It's like, nah, 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 just keeps going, right? Uh, then I repeat a uh, plot of just the basis functions as before. Uh, those are never going to change. They're data now frozen in time. 
And then I show you the, the posterior mean weights multiplied by those basis functions, because this is what that predictor up top is. You take each of the basis functions and you multiply it by a weight. So I'm focusing on the posterior mean after we run the QAP model. Um, there's uncertainty here, and I'll show you what that looks like in a little bit. Uh, but show you what happens. And what happens now is that you're adding at any point on the uh, horizontal axis in this model, say at the year 1306 again, you're just adding those values together uh, where the lines are. And so two lines get added together and that determines the prediction for the temperature. And we'll get the third thing up in a second, but I want you to appreciate this is what's going on. And so here it is. Uh, now showing you the resulting spline. It's not super wiggly. I told you it was lines, right? So this is a piecewise linear approximation uh, of the temperature trend. And it's, you might say, well, this is awful. Well, that depends on what you want to do. If you want to detrend at a very long time scale, this is perfect. And then you can look at, you know, smaller, like 100-year oscillations in temperature using known data about causes, like ocean cycles and things like that. It's about what you want to detrend and what scale you want to do it at. Yeah, so again, the, you add uh, the basis time weight things because that's the equation from use has to do, and you get the spline at the bottom. The spline at the bottom has the uncertainty interval in it. That's why it's fat and it has little bow tie shapes to it. So I'm doing, that's for the full posterior. I think that's the 89% uh, compatibility interval for mu shown at the bottom. Does this make sense? Does it make enough sense that you can go into the chapter and run the code and figure it out? That's really all the lectures can do for you, I'm afraid. Yeah. Um, Okay, let's do, where you, let's do more wiggles. Most people think about splines as being things that are much wigglier than this. So let's do a higher order spline. Let's do a third order. Cubic splines are probably the most common splines. Uh, they're flexible, but they're not crazy. That's, that's, that's a good consensus term. Uh, right. So here's an example. Let's do 15 knots. The more knots you have, the more times the thing can bend. I encourage you when you go home and you play with this code, there's just a place in my code where the number 15 appears. Make that any number you like. Make it smaller, make it bigger. Look at how it changes the prediction. You can just keep rerunning the code, changing the number of knots, changing the basis of this thing. Um, the, the, what you'll see, and this is nearly always true with basis functions, is uh, you can have too few knots to fit the curve, but at some point you've got enough knots and there'll be almost no change in the curve after a certain point. I think with this that happens around 40. Something like that. I forgot. I haven't done a really systematic study. But go ahead. 40 is no problem. You can have 40 parameters and this crap can handle it. Uh, it it'll do it. You, know, you might have to wait a little while. Uh, like a minute or something. Right. So uh, this is what the basis functions look like in that case. We have a bunch of local functions. Now they're wigglier because they're cubic. Uh, but they also overlap more. So at any particular point, you can have as many as uh, uh, four of these curves overlapping at any particular point. And so more parameters are, are turned on at any particular point on the x-axis. And so you can get more complicated shapes. But each parameter still only acts locally. Uh, this is the magic of it. And so you don't get that bizarre uh, phenomenon with polynomials. What does this look like when we, when we get the posterior distribution? Here I'm showing you, I think this is 50 samples from the posterior distribution of this model for the, for the weights, and I multiply the weights times the basis functions. This looks great, doesn't it? I just love this. Rainbow of joy. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so they, you see there's all this wiggle. And again, at every point, you just add all these together, and uh, uh, these weighted basis functions, and you get a spot prediction. I'll show you that in a second. Um, I want to show you is that there's some of these regions, there's substantial uncertainty about the weight, right? You can see there's a lot of scatter going on. Uh, in a second, that's, so a lot of that uncertainty is going to collapse. And this is a phenomenon you'll get used to with Bayesian models, is at the parameter level, there's typically more uncertainty than there is at the prediction level. And the reason is because the parameters combine to make a prediction. And so you can be uncertain about the exact value of each parameter, but you'd be really certain about their sum. And these models typically think that way. If you ask them, okay, tell me exactly the value of weight parameter three, it's like, well, it's between this value and this value. Uh, and then they say, okay, now tell me the, the position of the spline uh, at, at the point where that parameter is active, and it can be super confident about that. 
because if you make W3, the, the third weight, bigger, you have to make something else smaller to maintain the prediction in the range of the data. And the model's handling all that because it's just using Bayes' formula to rank the relative plausibility, since it handles the mechanics of all those trade-offs for you. So when you plot the lower level representation, that is the parameters of the model, there are typically going to be more uncertainty than there is about the predictions of the model. It's a weird thing. You're going to get used to this. You'll see it over and over again. And I'll remind you, because I'm annoying, uh, of these phenomenons over and of this this phenomenon over and over again. Okay, uh, I want to draw your attention. Of course, the, the trend has to go up at the end, right? Because of you know carbon, uh, <laughs> and uh, so you'll see what uh, the fifteenth basis function ends up doing with its weight. It has a very high weight, right? It really pops up like a dandelion uh, on the end over there, and you can get a sense how these things combine. So when we add them now, we've got a much smoother wiggly spline of the temperature trend. Now, of course, this could get wigglier, and again, it's about your scientific purpose. How much do you want to detrend it, because at what scale of fluctuations are you interested in scientifically? Because right? the spline will let you subtract out any, any remaining variation, deviations from this spline, is some other phenomenon you could study with other data. Yeah, like ocean cycles or whatever. Does this make some sense? So again, you, you need to go home and run this data, uh, uh, run this code, and play around with the wiggliness and how many um, knots and uh, uh, the degree of the basis functions you like, um, and you can uh, uh, see how this thing responds. Uh, change the priors too, because there's some penalty active here, and I want you to discover those things. Okay, I should, I should wrap up. I'm about a minute over here. Um, so uh, there are lots of different kinds of spline strategies. I just showed you the most common, the basis spline strategy. Uh, you have to view knots in the basis degree as choices. They're like priors, right? But they're not probability distributions. They're choices you make that define the model. The model will not question them. Yeah, and so you have to deal with that. There are ways of doing Bayesian splines where the, the number of knots is a parameter uh, that you can get a posterior distribution for. Um, I haven't showed you that, but you'll see that if you, if you follow this literature for very long. Uh, all of these things is that uh, when we get to chapter seven, I'll be able to say something more substantive about these choices and why we'd worry about, you know, why not just have as a knotted every year, for example, why not? Your computer can handle that, by the way. You'll end up with like 1,200 parameters, uh, but you can do it. I guarantee you 1,200 parameters. It sounds frightening, where your computer's like, okay, I'll get to work, right? And it just starts chopping down parameters <laughs> uh, and eventually it'll work through it all. Um, uh, there are other types of splines that don't require knots, and they have other strategies um, uh, for finding them automatically. When we get to chapter 14, we're going to look at another um, smooth approximation technique called the Gaussian process, and we'll be able to do comparisons between the two. Uh, Gaussian processes are related to phylogenetic regression, those of you who are evolutionary biologists here, and I'll, I'll draw that connection for you when we get there. Um, okay, homework. Um, I haven't finished the homework. Uh, I made the third problem too hard, I realized this morning. So, yeah, you're welcome. And so I'm going to revise it and I'll post it in the afternoon after I've had some coffee and become a nicer person. Uh, <laughs> and now it's tuning. New homework problems are very dangerous and I'm very cautious about these things. But it'll go up this afternoon. Um, you've got until the second week of January to do this. Uh, don't wait until the last minute, please. <laughs> um, it's not super hard homework, though. But it's going to get more complicated because there's more moving pieces now. When you come back in the new year, I will welcome you back into the new year to many joys, uh, including multiple regression. We will have a bunch of different predictor variables in there. That opens up the possibility for us to look at causal inferences. These models aren't causal, but we want causal inference from them. So we're going to confront that problem. We're going to look at causal graphs, things called colliders, uh, and many other joys to come. Question? Um, this is Ah, uh, yeah. Since this is now not a um, conjugate prior, we make some kind of error in approximating the posterior as a precaution, I guess. Is there a way to quantify that error? Uh, that's a great question and a complicated one that uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> Absolutely. When we get to Markov chains, that would be the time to ask that question again. And then we can do the comparison. That, is that good? Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Thank you all and have a great uh, winter break.